was just making a joke about how we never <laughs> fucked up recording, and I fucked up recording. So luckily, we only got about fifty-five seconds into it. Uh-huh. But uh-huh. It was podcasting gold. It was, it was, oh, it was it's gold. A shame. It's a we, shame we said the most insightful thing. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just the perfect mix of knowledge and banter. Oh yeah, that's what they come to us for: knowledge and banter, <laughs> indeed, in their throngs. Um, Dan, episode one hundred and one. We're back. Welcome there to the show. There is no pressure for episode 101. No. I feel like it's just going to be what it is. You know yeah. what I mean? Episode just 100. Just like all the others. Pressure. It's just, yeah, just like, like episode yeah. 100, really. But <laughs> it's true. Just like all of the episodes. Yeah. <laughs> Phew. Um, we made it past that monumental milestone. We just yeah. keep going. Yeah, exactly. Only a well, little bit of housekeeping from our last episode. We, in the Critique of the Gotha Program episode, we talked a little bit about... Um, directly and indirectly social labor and we talked about how this was the first time really we were gonna kind of be discussing this topic and uh it, bear with us if we made any mistakes turned out we made some mistakes as per usual but we had some uh brave listeners who reached out and were very helpful and were like oh actually like you know you here's here's why you were wrong but don't worry about it uh, you're doing your best. And it's like, oh, thank you so much. So anyway, I'm just going to re- read something real quick. I actually reached out um, to a friend of the show, Tom, from From Alpha to Omega, to help explain this. And I'll just read really quickly what he said about this idea of indirectly versus directly social labor. Um, he says that indirect versus direct social labor mostly affects, I think it's correct to say, whether society is in control of production or whether production controls society. If labor was determined directly as social labor, you would not need the mediation of the market to determine whether labor was social or not. All labor would be defined as social or not prior to production. But this is impossible with private property relations. Communism requires directly social labor. But you could have societies that have directly social labor that are not communist, as in, I think, the Incan Empire that had no money or markets, and thus labor was directly social. But it was not communist, blah, 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 blah. The point for that is, I think that I might have been implying in last week's episode or last episode two weeks ago that um, directly social labor kind of affects the worker and the value that they get from working. Of course, that is not the case. We all know that workers are not remunerated for the value that they produce, but are remunerated. Well, not remunerated. They just sell their labor power, right? So a bit of a correction there. The only thing I just wanted to bring that up because I do think that this is really important. And this is kind of like how we get around being controlled by production because we can have market socialism, as Tom is saying, and still um, be controlled by production if everybody's still kind of like, you know, if indirectly social labor is still the norm. You can still have that <clears throat> whether or not you own the means of production, right, um, as a as the working class. So just a bit of a correction there. Um, yeah, I think it's fairly important. So, you know, hopefully people who listen to that episode come back and listen to this. If you didn't, too bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for that um, addendum correction from Tom. Yes. Um, yeah, it's it's good it's good to be reminded and it's something that I stray away from and come back to that the sort of centrality of that question of um workers being in control and not just of a single workplace but how we could do that uh collectively how we can run the means of production both in a decentralized distributed way but also in a way which has I suppose mechanisms of control like f- controlling functions and I'm, that's what stands behind the the notion of using uh, labor time accounting as a mechanism for giving us the power and the knowledge um, to fully comprehend the productive process that we're engaged in because otherwise we're small sort of um, potentially alienated cogs in a machine that we don't understand and it's about taking control of that machine, I guess, um, that social machinery. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's funny because I think when we <laughs> did one of our patented, what are we going to read this week? Let's just read some Palmatic episodes. We <laughs> read an essay of his called Workers Control. And I feel like this is not necessarily what he was getting at, but I feel like this is maybe what was missing in that essay because it's like he was trying to say, you know, you got to have real workers control. You can't just have nominal workers control, right? Like he's criticizing the Soviet Union. Like, okay, it's in your constitution. Workers own the means of production or whatever, but there's clearly not workers control. Just like he might've even said at one point in there that like co-ops aren't necessarily workers control just because they own the means of production. They're still operating in a capitalist environment. So they don't really have control over their products, right? I think that this is kind of like the economics behind it, how you actually get there. Um, 
in the way that the council communists, the like Dutch and German variants, at least the GIC get around it is you get remunerated for the work that you do one hour for one hour. And, you know, other than the deductions that get made for society, that's it, mm -hmm. you know, and it's so. And it's quite a comprehensible, both that argument that you've just made, but also what Tom said in his response to your email or message is very comprehensible. I feel like for my part last week and my efforts to try and explain that distinction between social and that or directly social and non-directly social labor. So I've just rambled about um, socially necessary labor time. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> whereas um, a simple discussion of whether um, the valuing of commodities is done in a conscious or unconscious way, in a way which is either mediated through the market or which is uh, known and understood um, in a comprehensible way by all workers. That's quite an actually relatively simple distinction to make. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, we've read Critique of the Gotha Program for the show now twice. Still figuring it out. The third time we'll get there. The third time we'll understand it. That's for sure. Um, all right. I don't think there's anything else. I don't think anybody wants to hear me update them on Shohei Otani's uh, free agency, which is kind of driving <laughs> me crazy and is making me lose all of my hair. Um, but hopefully by the time this episode comes out, he'll be a Dodger. We're recording on Wednesday. I'm kind of going a bit crazy not knowing anything about it, but I am wearing my okay. Shohei jersey. So, you know, this is what okay. it is. <laughs> okay. You, know, you can explain that to me afterwards. I will cross my fingers now. <laughs> it's great. It's great. I love well, listening to you talk about baseball, Jack. Um, <laughs> But maybe I don't know how much the sarcasm there was in there. But, no, 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 you know. no, no, no. Okay. No. All right. No. You're just rooting for him to go to the Rockies. That's why I know you. Okay, Dan. Speaking <laughs> of Japan, speaking of Shohei Otani, this is our big Japan episode. That was my transition. <laughs> we're doing we're my, doing our big Japan my, episode. Maybe Jack doesn't like baseball at all. It's just a convenient source for segues <laughs> yeah. into the topics that we're going to talk about. Yeah, exactly. Know. I'm not you so know sure. whose labor is not directly social is the players and the MLBPA. No, uh, Dan, this is our J big Japan episode. That's how I'm pitching it. <laughs> um, I forget what it was. A couple weeks, a couple episodes ago, I think it was in the Walter Rodney where Japan sure. came up. Yeah. And Japan's transition to capitalism. And you were like, there'd probably be something that we could stand to know something about at all. Japan's transition to capitalism and their kind of like foray into feudalism, question mark, long feudalism, wasn't actually feudalism. What was the shogunate? Blah, 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 blah. So we found two things to read. <laughs> One of them was an appendix from a book that we've been talking about reading for a long time, but showed up on my doorstep and it was like 500 pages. So we did not read the whole book. It's from Perry Anderson's Lineages of the Absolute Estate. And it is his first appendix. Um, entitled Japanese Feudalism, which is very good. And then after that, we just read a short essay of his um, called The Prussia of the East, question mark, which is um, not so much focused on feudalism, but it's focused on kind of Japan's, uh, basically he's comparing and contrasting the development of Prussia slash Germany with the development of Japan and their kind of development towards um, capitalism and then fascism and kind of like the, you know, similarities and differences that they both have. Um, I think we'll probably just take these in order and just start with the one from Lineages of the Absolute Estate, the appendix. But um, first thoughts, what'd you think? Uh, Japan, we're getting there. We're moving away from Western Europe and talking about, you know, other parts of the world. So look at us. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think maybe we both had this idea that maybe this is something we should explore. I think coming out of the vague reference that was made to Japan's both transition to capitalism, but also its relationship to the West that was made in the Walter Rodney book. It's definitely something I've heard in the past that um, I didn't really understand, but this sort of um, notion that Japan's development is significant and different in that its process, its transition to capitalism was not marked by a notable um, phase of imperial conquest of Japan, I suppose. It's one of these... It's a it's a non Western country that um, that was not was never an imperial was never a colony of an imperial power I suppose um, and was in fact in some respects an imperial power itself for brief periods of its history. Um, now I think from reading we'll get uh, maybe we can ask uh, I can ask myself or we can ask my, uh, ourselves that question at the end of this episode how this these two readings have sort of impacted that understanding of. Um, 
the significance of Japan's very deliberate closing itself off to the West and to the rest of the world entirely, um, and how that impacted its rather, as we'll discover, quite accelerated and deliberate transition into capitalism. Um, and obviously, when people talk in these, I think the, the, the narrative that people are trying to present when they talk about Japan um, as a non-colonized state is to talk about its, um, well, I suppose it's mid-20th century capitalist dynamism and its growth to be uh, one of the biggest economies in the world. I won't pretend to know very much about contemporary Japanese economics and it's sort of like the sort of like long, long period of stagnation its economy has been in now. Um, but as we'll see from reading these two texts, um, it's had significant and quite interesting and potentially quite unique engagements with the Western world, which have really quite significantly affected its the nature of the development of its econo economy and its politics. And so in some respects, like it's closing itself off led to this quite significant and accelerated engagement with the West, um, which is an interesting um, piece of history that we're, I'm pleased that we've explored and excited to get to talk about. Um, in terms of the text that we've read, obviously, Perry Anderson, we've read before, and um, the, the, the appendix from the lineages of the absolute estate is exactly what you'd expect from him, like a really detailed but quite accelerated, broad and long history full of all the detail you would need and a good amount of sort of theorizing as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to have the conversation. Yeah. I, um, I think this is basically, we're kind of back to discussing transition debate stuff, which yeah. is interesting. And I correct me if I'm wrong, what I took away from that brief reference to Japan in Walter Rodney's, how Europe underdeveloped Africa was, he seemed to be implying that on some level, Japan was already like, tending towards something like capitalism by the time capitalism was kind of like forced upon it by the West. Right. Um, and it's kind of like really abrupt opening up to the rest of the world. Um, we'll get to maybe how we feel about that once we kind of talk a little bit about the history, um, because it's a really interesting question. And I, yeah, this, this is actually like reading about a completely different geographic place and it's transition debate. I had the same feeling when we were talking about China in the episode that we did with the Schwang reading, which I forget what it was called, Sorghum and Steel. Um, it's a weird mixture of like feeling like everything's kind of a bit teleological because you begin to see similar patterns in places that were more or less completely geographically isolated with like small trade networks to the rest of the world, right? But then also pretty significant differences, right? In Japanese so-called feudalism versus, you know, feudalism in France or feudalism in England. And they're kind of transitions to um, something like capitalism. So we'll get there. It, this is all really interesting stuff. Um, for Perry Anderson's um, appendix on Japanese feudalism, um, he starts pretty early. And I don't know how much of this early, early history we really need to get into he's he's basically like to tell this story and we probably do need to begin here he's like you need to go back to the seventh century um <laughs> well, to... i mean it's, sorry sorry to interrupt you but like in in the passage from antiquity to feudalism he basically starts with the founding of the like greek yeah, antique states like two thousand years before like the transition to from uh, antiquity <laughs> to feudalism even takes place and takes us through a, an all, a whole different transition and an entire mode of production <laughs> yeah and collapse and then transition and then you get to what we're talking about it's funny i used yes. to listen to um dan carlin's podcast hardcore history a long time ago and whenever he'd put out an episode it would be like the joke would always be like um okay, we're going to talk about like the sinking of the USS Maine. And to do that, we need to begin with like Diocletian's like economic reforms in the third <laughs> century. It's kind of a similar thing. It makes a bit more sense here, but it does begin sure. like maybe over a thousand years before the meat of what we actually want to talk about. So in the seventh century in Japan, you get what's basically the development of an imperial state, right? For the first time. And he mentions that this comes about due to something called the Taika reforms, which were kind of a reform based around creating a kind of centralized imperial state with an extensive bureaucracy, hereditary bureaucracy, which I thought was kind of interesting, um, and was basically modeled pretty heavily along what he calls Sinic lines, so like Sinic influences, so influence from mainland Asia, from China specifically, right? Um, and 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, from there we get developments of a couple different shogunates, but I mean, what in this do you think you want to touch on before we kind of get into the actual shogunate stuff? Is there anything in here to kind of mention about how the imperial state was formed that you think that was necessary or should we just kind of like keep the train going? Um, I think, no, I know. Own, I mean, it, he, he basically only mentions it so he can then talk about sort of an 800 year collapse of that system. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, it, like it barely exists. It seems to barely exist for... Um, as a coherent system for any particularly length of time, it's already collapsing under its own contradictions. The primary one he mentions is it sort of like lacks a kind of Mandarin class. And so there isn't a sort of like, I think by which he means, what he means by that is there isn't any um, uh, sort of like bureaucratic class holding a unitary state together. Um, It's interesting that he reuses some language, I think that he also uses in, the passages from antiquity to feudalism where he talks about like centrifugal and centripetal forces um and he talks about this being taken apart by a centrifugal force i think anyway well <laughs> that, that, now when i say it out loud it feels like the wrong force right it's the it's not it's not being held together and so yeah centrifugal pushes outwards right and centripetal yeah, pulls inwards right so there isn't any there isn't any internal force which holds it and allows it to cohere and hold together rather what there is is a fragmenting tendency immediately um and the sort of like i i have to apologize for any horrible pronunciations of japanese terms no right? no, so. no no people come to us for japanese pronunciations dan it's fine but he talks about like um the development of a shoan or like a shoan class who are like the makings of what will become analogous to a feudal nobility right like the state is already breaking down into um uh parceled out um semi-private estates um with a sort of like a sort of central controlling military nobility and a sort of um initially somewhat free but gradually more and more um a peasantry which is functioning in a in the way that uh, in a as a form of serfdom where they're sort of tied to the land and to a relationship to um a lord yeah well and i think it's also worth just mentioning too like he he references um a, the kind of chinese state as this heavily centralized imperial power right but i remember it when we were reading about it in sorghum and steel like they made the point that there's, China wasn't like an absolutist state. Like most imperial powers, was absolutely not an imperialist state or an absolutist state back then. Just because, like, you know, they were making the argument there that China, as such, didn't really become a thing until the kind of like liberal and then also communist projects in the twentieth um, century, right? Because there was like one monarch, one imperial power, but then they were like there were many different countries, basically and regions that just owe. You know, I forget exactly what it was, whether it was a tithe or troops or something like that to the central power. So mm-hmm. just kind of worth I mean, touching on that. It's, yeah, I'm really glad that you made that parallel because in a lot of respects, uh, what what would evolve into Japanese feudalism bears much more resemblance to what you've just described there as sort of like um, an ostensibly centralized government or an ostensibly united state. But like, actually, there are um, significantly many parcelized um sovereign powers i suppose um and the sort of the the lords have particular power around taxation and lawmaking and adjudication of various things and it almost seems to like spread out from the sort of the central power of the shogunate and then there's sort of like a an a, a, both a geographical area and a sort of like portion of the noble class which owes significant fealty to the shogun and then a periphery to that which is has even less which is which is owes less fealty and is less heavily influenced by the center so yeah there does seem to be an interesting parallel there i guess which is definitely worth remarking on because and maybe that also draws something else into question like if we're in a position where there's a kind of central there's there's an empire that comes into existence and there is a centralizing power which is almost collapsing from the off 
and what constitutes itself over the next thousand years of history really is, or 1200 years of history is um, a pseudo centralized state with um, political and religious traditions and um, systems of law and um, convention which allow a centralized state form to exist, um, but also sort of maintaining all of these parcelized sovereignties and that kind of thing. Maybe it's wrong to read this as an empire transitions into feudalism, but rather a sort of general back and forth until an equilibrium state is reached where there's the right amount of centralism and the right amount of relationship between religious authority and the emperor and secular authority and the the shogunate and it's just like the right but this sort of balance is reached so that um you can then have a sort of somewhat stable japanese feudalism in a thousand years time i guess yeah and that's the one thing that i knew about japanese history right was that yeah there was always an emperor but the real person who actually controlled things was the shogun who was basically in charge of all of the samurai and was like the big general in control of all of the armed forces right and so that's kind of where the early japanese imperial state trends towards and he kind of puts a like a really interesting um not like timestamp, but like marker on when the shogunate really started to rise, right? These like retainers of of uh, lords, but that's also not the right way to say it. Kind of like military commanders, basically, right? He basically says that there was in the early Japanese imperialist state a standing army, a like centralized standing army, right? And he says that once the standing army around the kind of like 12th century started to collapse due to like waning imperial power, then you started to actually see the samurai and the shogun um take their place because there was still need right for like armies because of warring kind of uh domains right and everybody wanted to have their own every all the samurais wanted to have their own you know like army force right whether that was standing or whether it was just from like conscripting people um it was still necessary once these kind of like centralized army under the control of the emperor fell apart so that was that was definitely interesting i mean then eventually we start talking about like from here on out it is we start talking about shogunates and specific shogunates and that's how we kind of like split up japanese history um yeah i mean we could skip straight to the tokugawa shogunate i think maybe the second shogunate though there's something interesting there the ashikaga shogunate um this is kind of perry anderson makes the point that this is where we really start to see feudalism take place right this is where we start to see peasant mobility completely restricted this is where you actually start to see real systems of vassalage and benefits really put into place um as well as and this is kind of like another vocabulary word i had to learn the first page of his appendix is just like a list of words that i wrote down being like what i need to write these down uh daimyo which is basically like lords of specific domains who then had kind of like you know fiefs that they rented out to specific people um you start to see all of that start to develop. One thing about the peasantry, which is fascinating in this history, is A, that the commons didn't really exist in Japanese feudalism because there weren't as many kind of like um, livestock animals to kind of, you know, make the rounds and to kind of go around. So there wasn't really need for a commons. But then also he said two things that were crazy. One, which is that two thirds of what they created, what they produced, needed to go straight to their masters, right? To the daimyo, I suppose. And then on top of that, he said that one of the main differences in the peasantry to European feudalism was just how little land specific peasants controlled. He was like, they controlled like two or three acres at the most. I was like, holy shit, two or three acres and they're giving two thirds of that away. I was like, that is brutal. Um, but then again, I mean, I suppose one of the main crops that they were growing was rice. And I don't really know necessarily how much rice you can get from much, specific yeah. acreage, but two and three, two to three acres is tiny. Mm hmm. Yeah, it would have been nice to have more context about the structure of the Japanese village and how that uh, social func how that what social form it took and what the relationship was, what the how that community existed, kind of thing. They say they say at one point that the these tithes were paid not by the individual peasant necessarily, but by the village, and so I wonder whether there was like a uh, was more of like a community effort to meet that. Um, agricultural requirement i suppose um one of the really interesting things so you're yeah you're right to say that it was in this sort of like 
second of these significant shogunates that he goes through is the point where you get a sort of like full development of what you, in some respects, what you'd recognize as a European form of uh, feudalism, um, sort of like the full development of a thief system. And one of the things that he says is that um, in com- in comparison to the sort of like noble system that existed under the emperor, um, where the nobility was still localized in in the cities, in the re- sort of the religious center of the country, now, because you're getting to the point where the feudal lords um, are now located in their own personal fiefs um, and they are much more um, connected to the peasantry, which they're exploiting, what you therefore get, similar to some of the things that he says about the one of the in, in interesting things that came out of our reading of um, uh, passages from um, antiquity to feudalism is the the, in some respects, dynamic nature of feudalism and how we're often shared that feudalism is sort of this backward, unproductive mode of production, um, when in actual fact it was quite dynamic and took quite a lot of interest in improving the productivity of peasants and the output from the land. Um, obviously, that differs from capitalism in the sense that those surpluses weren't then reinvested, so you don't have sort of that the reinvestment cycle that's necessary for the capitalist mode of production but what you do have is increasing productivity um and he points out that um this new um noble class is much better at extracting surpluses from the peasants in some ways that's probably quite a uh, a brutal activity right like we're, what we're probably talking about here is um quite violent extraction methods although he doesn't go into it but also what he does talk about is how the productivity of peasant labor is improved and in some respects also how the technology that is employed by Japanese peasants at this time is also improving you have sort of like um, new uses of metal plows and similar technological advances that were happening in Europe at the same time I think yeah things like um like he said there's a lot of like land reclamation projects that went on at around this time and it's interesting because he you know he's, he is doing exactly what you're saying he's like counterposing that to the typical idea of feudalism which is zero growth nothing ever changed but it's interesting because it made me think it must have been in the book of his that we read uh not passages from antiquity to feudalism i think it was in that where he's talking he talked a lot about how there was actually quite a bit of land reclamation going on in england um towards the like crisis of the 1300s right um of like late medieval europe um but what was interesting this could be wrong but it kind of made me think that a lot of those land reclamation projects and kind of like massive ecological catastrophes you know like the extinction of wolves or like the cutting down of all of the old growth forests things like that that occurred around that time seemed like they came about because what he was implying was because of like a competition between the you know feudal lords and the peasantry he's kind of like it wasn't just one class doing these land reclamation projects it was both because you know, peasants wanted to have more that they didn't have to give to the Lord and the Lords just wanted more domains. Right. Whereas it seems to be what he's saying in this is that in Japanese feudalism, um, it was so stable, especially by the time we get to the third shogunate, the Tokugawa shogunate in like the 1600s, um, that it kind of just allowed for a kind of like natural expansion that, you know, it, it might've been forced, I supposed, but at a certain extent, it kind of seemed like those projects came about because of the stability of the structure, the stability of the shogunates, whereas a kind of like comparable thing that went on in at least, you know, British Isles like feudalism was kind of the opposite. It was because sure it was stable, but there was also this massive competition. Maybe those things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, but I think the kind of like um, where he puts the importance and what he kind of emphasizes in those two cases is at least just worth mentioning maybe. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I guess it, it, it's worth mentioning at this point, the other thing that happens um, is you now get a, a much greater curtailment of the rights of peasants, like they're much more heavily tied to the land um, and not allowed to move. You also get sort of like a lot more internal barriers, um, which is similar to European feudalism in a lot of respects, right? There's a lot more... Um, uh, barriers to trade and to movement and to the movement of goods. I say this because um, it's some of these things which are going to become 
much later in history be revealed as some of the more contradictory factors of the Tokugawa shogunate, which, shogunate, which um, eventually lead to its decline. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. You're right to say that, like, for that 200, so maybe maybe we sort of, like, uh, I, I guess what happens is that sort of, like, um, Ashikaga shogunate, is that how you pronounce it, is um, creates this sort of, like, unitary rule, but also it's incredibly weak. And for obvious reason, really, what's being built up is all of these um, parcelized sovereignties, all of these sort of like separate um, lordships with peasant tenants, but also access to their own um, sort of like uh, own retinues of samurai who owe fealty to them. So what you have is all of these local lords with their own militaries um, and with a with this, I guess, the same expansionist tendencies that happen in European feudalism, right? Like what is productive and what is valuable is land and is land with peasants attached to it who work on it and can be taxed. Um, and one of the things he says about this particular um, state arrangement was a lot of the borders were quite amorphous and it was quite difficult to know who ruled what plots of land. So I think it it lent itself quite heavily to um, like border conflicts and wars. Um, and this is, rec- this is, I think this is considered to be quite an unstable period of Japanese history where, which was very heavily prone to um, continued conflict. Obviously analogous to Europe, what you also have is a knightly class in the, uh, in the form of the samurai who, who's, social existence is tied to sort of like military honor and this kind of thing. So again, you have these uh, somewhat warlike militarized social tendencies, uh, which lend themselves to um, social conflict quite easily. And that's one of the things that proliferates itself through this period of history. Yeah. And, and you're right. And it, it is interesting though, to note that like with each turnover of a, sh- of a shogunate, like, I suppose now we are talking about the Tokugawa shogunate, which is like the famous one. And it's, you know, the one where all of the stuff happened established in 1603. Um, In all of these shogunates, though, it seems like, and even with the imperial polity, like way back in the 600s, like at the beginning is when they're the most stable. This could be obvious to people, but it's like Tokugawa shogunate was at its most stable at the beginning. And he gives a couple of reasons for that, right? Like one of them is exactly what you're saying. It's this idea of parcelized sovereignty. These things kind of just fall apart over time. Um, but then also he, he kind of gets into like a question of how it is that the shogunate actually controlled things. And he says that the shogunate itself, specifically around this era, controlled 20% of all arable land directly, right? Which is nothing to sneeze at. And they were using this to more or less basically just grow rice. There were some other cash crops, but it was to grow rice and to, you know, use that, sell in the market or just, you know, store, I suppose, for themselves. But he also says that one of the main things that made it more stable at the beginning, as opposed to at the end, in terms of the centralized power, was that they made the majority of the money by owning most of the gold and silver mines and minting the coinage, right? And at the beginning, it was a lot easier to kind of, you know, labor was very productive. It was kind of easier to get the gold and the silver that was closer to, I don't know, the surface or however it was that they were doing it. But then as 200 years go on towards the end of the Tokugawa shogunate, they stop being able to mine gold and silver as easily. And this leads them to debase their currency to a point where he basically says the currency towards the end of the Tokugawa shogunate was basically just a fiat currency, which I thought was really interesting. He was like, there was so little gold and silver actually in these coins that was basically just like, yeah, this is worth something. Don't worry about it. And um, eventually that would be one of the things that would lead to kind of massive instability um, once the Americans showed up. But mm, um, we'll get there. I suppose that's yeah. a good point to to just bring up one of the most important things, if not the most important thing that happened during the Tokugawa Shogunate, which is that they closed off Japan <laughs> to everybody, basically, to all foreigners. They said, we'll have one port where people can show up sometimes if they need more supplies way down in the south. But other than that, um, we do not want any foreigners coming in and we do not want any Japanese people leaving Japan. And the reason for this, Perry Anderson is kind of like... <laughs> he's kind of sympathetic towards because it basically had to do with Catholic missionaries who were showing up and the shogunate being like, Oh, this is clearly just the first step in European imperialism, which it was right. Like it absolutely was. And so while this might've been a rational decision, um, much like the coinage 
and parcelized sovereignty, its kind of current contradictions would be borne out over time and would eventually be one of the main things that would lead to its collapse, right? But also, yeah, I don't know, also to its stability because they weren't colonized, right? So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it, I mean, we'll, as we get into talking about the, the sort of like, uh, the w clearly one of the things that brings about the decline of that is that that decision to close off the country to um, foreign influence, I guess. Um, there are a few things about that he draws out about feudalism in Japan that he talks about as being somewhat slightly different to European feudalism and some of the things that sort of lend itself, lend themselves favorably to its stability or something that is well leveraged by this sort of series of shogunates up to the Tokugawa one, which is, as we've said, the, the one that's really quite stable for over 200 years of history. Um, he talks about their, well, he sort of like, I don't, I don't want this to sound like quite a vague interpretation that sort of sounds a bit woo woo, I suppose, but like, um, there are, there, there seem to be bonds of fealty and honor between lords and their, um, uh, retinues i suppose and then also going upwards between um various other lords and then the shogun on top of the whole system which sort of like um makes it a very stable system much more than existed in europe like those those connections of um honor seem quite seem considerably more significant now there are some material reasons for that that i'll get, get onto in a minute um and then also um, there's a real tendency in Japanese feudalism for um, interfamilial conflict not to come about. Like there are tendencies whereby feel filial bonds are much stronger. And one of the things he says is that like it's incredibly rare for like I don't know whether he uses this language exactly, but what I understood to be the thrust of his argument was like children don't challenge their parents or like. Um, distant relatives don't challenge for for rule um one of the things that i understood to be a distinctive feature of the takagawa shogunate in particular was that um you have the shogun um and then around him you have like 20 or so very significant uh, noble families who if i understand the language and the way perry anderson describes it there's a there's a way in which the lineage or the succession of the sogan that can pass to any one of those um, families was that your understanding? And there seemed to be some very interesting sort of social functions that w were put in place. So there's like this um, sort of like body of about twenty or so uh, other noble lineages who have this access to. Uh, the position of shogun, but also are then barred from taking up positions, sort of like bureaucratic and functionary positions within the state that were served, were f sort of seemingly fulfilled by other um, noble families. I guess the point that I'm making is there, from my reading of this text, there were quite significant um, social rules and regulations which stabilized the system and sort of like built that. Um, social structure i suppose that were really interesting to me anyway yeah i was i was a bit confused by this you've kind of just clarified a bit of it to me because it seemed like perry anderson was like uh trying to talk about how european feudal relations and inheritance i could be getting this backwards but was he saying that 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 was slightly more like litigious and legalistic mm -hmm. and you knew exactly yeah. who was going to get what whereas at first glance, in Japanese feudalism, you might think it's a bit more convoluted, but that might just be another way of saying that it was more dynamic because he was like, e adoption was actually just a thing, right? If it's like, oh, I have two like fail sons, I'm not going to give my, you know, like thief to them. Oh, this guy seems smart. Let's give it to him. That seemed to be what he was saying. Yeah, he does mention adoption. And yeah, perhaps what he means is the succession, perhaps in all of these different um noble lineages was as you say much more dynamic than it was in european feudalism there was also this sort of like social convention of what do they call them like social hostages or familial hostages or something yeah, like this it's yeah, right. like family members are sent to other courts or other cities or um 
yeah, to, to, to basically function as a sort of sort of hostages against uh, rebellion from any of these other families. And also, there's this convention that like six months out of every two years, like um, all of these noble families have to reside in the capital city, um, meaning that people aren't allowed to like. Well, I su- I suppose these like. Um, I suppose in some respects, rebellion isn't allowed to fester in these sort of peripheral places because everybody is, with a certain degree of regularity, brought into the centre of society and of culture and intermingles and spends time at court. And um, um, I say this, these are the kind of like material things that I was referring to when I was saying where there was this sort of like... um, greater sense of honor and fealty maybe there is also this fear that like your family members are going to be killed if you rebel kind of thing there are these like (laughs) material social functions social structures which are um the basis for this the nature of the society um and interestingly as we go forward uh, it's that it's that requirement to spend time living in the capital city um that contributes quite significantly to some of the breakdown tendencies of this form of feudalism but we can get to those in a little while yeah i'm getting professional business cards made up that just say professional hostage (laughs) (laughs) professional hostage (laughs) i mean it's funny because you do it seems like you do see that in european feudalism but maybe it's more of the like exception rather than the rule i really found this just goes to show you why the form of any given structure matters right it's like why it matters now it's like you know we've all wound up with capitalism But it would be very difficult to say that China's trajectory currently is the same as, you know, the uh, parliamentary democracy in Holland because there's a different form of the state, right? And it's like, maybe this is one of the reasons, all of those things that you're saying, why Japanese feudalism managed to be so stable despite being rife with all these contradictions is because of the form of, okay, hey. Six months out of the year, I want everybody to come to the capital just so I can keep an eye on you, right? Keep and about how that actually gave it extra life. It's really interesting. Um, another kind of parallel I mean, with European. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, the only thing that you, when you just said that, like I suppose in some respects, like the intermarrying of noble families in Europe was a form of hostage yeah, taking. I mean, that's what you're that's what you <laughs> were implying, right? But like, <laughs> <laughs> jeez. But I don't know. Maybe um, maybe we maybe they didn't care enough about their daughters when they sent them off to these places. So. Yeah, true. I I I read an interesting bit of lore around your neck of the woods. By the way, Dan, I meant to mention mm. this about a similar neck of thing. The woods, isn't it? My lore. I just looked oh. it up. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> just I was obsessed like, with my lore. <laughs> I, I was like, this this is this is a name from Warhammer Forty Thousand, and I looked it up, and it's named after. Do you know the story behind the saint Mylor? It's no, no, so no, no, no. funny, dude. He's one of these saints that it's just like, why are there so many saints in Christianity? This guy didn't do anything that impressive. What it was is that he was like the son of like a local king or something like that, and um a rival baron or something came and killed the king and was going to kill the kid but was like i don't know some monk was like don't do it don't kill my lore so what he did is he chopped off his hand and he chopped off his foot and then as the kid grew up he was given this prosthetic that like slowly started to adapt to being his hand and he could move it like as if it was his real hand and then the baron came back and killed him it's like that was the guy's (laughs) entire life i don't know why he's a saint anyway since i had to get that off my chest that was like okay. that cracked yeah. me up i was like what did this guy do he didn't do anything <laughs> it's like he had his hand and his foot chopped off and then he was murdered it's no, like, no he's got a town named after him in cornwall and <laughs> yeah, exactly. probably, probably a, multiple churches named after him as well butterfly effect and now know, jack what, is obsessed what? with the town <laughs> <laughs> anyway getting back mm, to interesting it. aside thank you interesting aside um One of the other things that I guess we need to get into while we're talking about um, the development of Japanese feudalism towards maybe a capitalistic direction, and I think that this is probably what Walter Rodney was referring to, is the buildup of a merchant class under the Tokugawa shogunate and how they kind of kept getting slightly too powerful and the kind of like local lords in the shogunate kind of had to like smack them back into place and force them to stop being a class, basically. So towns eventually started to you know, spring up and kind of thrive, right? He makes a point that on average towns were like, well, he didn't say on average, but he was saying that there were a number of towns in Japan around this time in the Tokugawa shogunate that were at least 10,000 people. 
um, and you actually started getting manufacturing centers. So in Osaka, that was one of the places where you started to get textile manufacturing. You started to get um, sake brewing in different regions on along kind of like capitalistic lines, right? Like you started to see a proto, proto maybe not even a proto bourgeoisie, proto capitalist, just a bourgeoisie, right? Forming in the towns. And um, I always thought this this is pretty interesting because he, he makes the comparison to China again, where he says, just like in China, town dwellers, I forget exactly what they were called, Chonin or something like that, were basically um, banned from buying land. They were making all of this capital. They were reinvesting it back into their um, into their manufacturing companies or whatever. Um, and artisans were beginning to make quite a bit of money from commodity production. But when they wanted to do the thing what, that they wanted to do with their land, which is become landowners, they were disallowed from doing that. And I thought this was actually kind of interesting because the mechanics that the, that the kind of like feudal lords and the shogunate used to stop the merchant class from growing and getting too much power was A, they basically... Perry Anderson says that the merchant class was a class without political representation. They weren't allowed to have political representation in the government. They were just these kind of like wealthy people who were like, we're ready to do capitalism. We're ready to be here. We're ready to start accumulating. But they were forced not to because they didn't have political representation. And then also on top of that, when they started getting too much money and they started maybe doing a little bit of usury with the local lords by loaning them money, uh, the shogun would just basically come by and be like, oh, there's a new tax and just take all of their money. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because this just lad, this was just like it led to a really interesting dynamic. And I think this is maybe the thing that we're building towards in Japanese feudalism, which was feudal relations with let me see if I can find this. He said something really interesting where he was like you had yeah, he says that basically politically Japan was at the level of 14th century France, right? Where it hadn't really gone into its absolutist phase. It was just kind of like high Middle Ages uh, feudalism. But then he says economically, because of this massive turnover of commodities going on because of this burgeoning merchant class that was not allowed to have any political power, he says that economically Japan was actually at the level of like 18th century London, which blew my mind. I was hmm. like, wow, what a fascinating contradiction because you know before i read this if you were to tell me that that's what japan was i would have been like oh that lasted what a couple decades it seems like the contradictions there are many right and they're rife and they're huge but he's basically just like it lasted 200 years and was kind of just held together by force and also you know we can get into this in a bit but also because of um japan also just being closed off to the rest of the world but this the merchant class is so fascinating in japan when we talk about uh, a transition debate. It's just like, man, this is not something I would have predicted would have been necessarily really possible for the amount of time that it was happening. Mm -hmm. But it's really interesting because all of these developments in production, as you say, and in the growth of the merchant class are an emergent factor of some of the key features of Japanese feudalism. It, it, it seems the what I understood to be the argument that's being made actually is that these tendencies primarily stem from what I was saying before about um, the nobility being required to live in the capital city. Um, it led to the massive growth in Edo, which I think is modern day Tokyo, which like had a population at this time that was bigger than London and all the major cities of Europe, primarily because there was just these massive population influxes um, of the nobility. But I think also there were population pressures that were led to people moving into the cities as well um but like i think the primary driver here was a requirement for all of these noble lords to construct new mansions in the cities and sort of like then to deck them out in all the splendor and the sort of like consumer goods that were necessary to show off your wealth to all of your noble peers there was the requirement to dress in a particular way and to seem necessarily fashionable and well endowed and wealthy um and so that both created this huge manufacturing base in the cities but it wasn't necessarily manufacture they were ma manufacture of commodities but for the consumption of the noble elite right it wasn't like it wasn't necessarily the basis of a um uh 
commodity economy as we would recognize it as a capitalist commodity economy. It was almost like a feudal commodity economy. It reminded me of some of the things that we read about when we read from Ellen Meeks's Wood all that time ago and some of the things which I I attempted to, or I think we attempted to apply to the reading that we did about um, Spanish conquest of South America, right? Like how do lords under feudalism... Um, what do they do with the wealth that they accrue? Well, they just sort of spend it on splendid consumer things that show off their wealth and show how noble and highborn and important they are. They don't, which reinvest. is much cooler than capitalism. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that was the thing that was b- sort of building this productive, these productive towns. Right, was actually a requirement to service the whims and the wants of the noble lords. And then it seems what he's implying also is, therefore, there was a pressure upon the sort of landed noble lords to convert their tax revenues into cash. Um, And it was that pressure which then led to the growth and the significance of a merchant class, right? There had to be these intermediaries who would sort of like um, buy grain and invest in it and it even refers to like grain futures, uh, which is sort of like a an economic convention of capitalism, contemporary capitalism. That I don't really understand. So it's interesting to see it pop up in the context of feudal Japan, and I wonder what the parallel and significance of that is, or the parallel is to c- contemporary futures in all sorts of different commodities. Um, but yeah, so uh, as what so what what I'm implying here is that like the narrative here seems to be that there is this the growth of these other classes but they're a result of the specific dynamics and tendencies social and economic of japanese feudalism and not necessarily um a capitalist class waiting beneath the fetters of feudalism kind of thing but rather a particular type of feudal town a particular type of feudal trade a particular type of feudal production uh, which is an argument I'm now lifting from Ellen Meeks's word, I think. But that was my understanding of what Perry Anderson is saying, I guess. I don't know whether you agree. Yeah, or... well, maybe this is what Ellen Meeks's word was criticizing Perry Anderson about. And honestly, mm-hmm. the more we read about this, like, I don't know, I'm I'm worried, Dan, because I see myself slipping into, like, what she would call neo-Smithian arguments, right, about the development of capitalism. Because it's like, the thing that made me think this was that I was when Perry Anderson starts talking about how there was this tendency for this feudal merchant class to want to purchase land, right? And they wanted to basically do what we saw in Britain with the development of capitalism there. And I mean, I know that you would make the argument that it wasn't necessarily, as you're saying, like a capitalist class waiting to be sprung free. But I don't know. It's difficult not to see similarities amongst different geographic places and go well there were similar tendencies like i'm definitely not one of these people that's going to come out you know and be like well with the advent of the coin capitalism was waiting to you know spring forward with wage labor in samaria right it's like but also it's like uh, (laughs) i don't know it's difficult not to at least kind of entertain that idea yeah i mean yeah yeah yeah. i don't know whether that's i don't know what whether what you've described there is necessarily what Brenner means by neo smithian but rather as you say like in in england there was the desire and the capacity for um the development of certain landowning class who had the desire and the ability to reinvest the surpluses that they gained from agricultural production back into further production and all we're seeing here is so certain um social barriers to that process happening in japan so maybe maybe i take back what i said maybe that maybe it is just that there are the tendencies toward capitalism here and they're being fettered by um the strength or the conventions of japanese feudalism maybe that's how i'd moderate what i've already said i suppose to... i'm shrugging i don't know yeah, i mean who knows? it gets i think this gets into more of like a philosophical question about like how change actually comes about if only there was somebody that studied that dan if only we could actually mm. like go back and read something about maybe dialectics i don't know but i mean i don't know it's yeah all i'm saying is that it's difficult not to see similar tendencies here and kind of question that and go 
well, these clearly are fetters to accumulation, whether or not that would have wound up in capitalism. I don't know. But I suppose what we can start talking about is how Japan did wind up uh, working its way towards capitalism. And that has to do with two things, I guess, right? It's what we've been describing, these kind of contradictions um, coming center stage, whether that's debased coinage, whether that's the kind of like military of the centralized shogun kind of falling apart a little bit, uh, whether that's kind of, yeah, I mean, the parcelized sovereignty thing is, is the main thing, but it's also like immiseration of the peasantry. You start to see real peasant revolts around this time. Um, but it's all of those things. It's all of these contradictions combined with what he calls the exogenous impact of Western imperialism. And this was about as exogenous as an abrupt impact as you could possibly get because for a little bit of time around the kind of like middle of the 1800s and kind of going into the 1800s as well, you started to get either British whaling ships, Russian uh, merchant ships, and eventually kind of like American ships um, sailing around Japan, doing their thing. And then how this all kind of began was that they wanted to request resupplies at different Japanese harbors. And as we've already said, Togurawa Shogunate shut Japan off from the rest of the world. And there was one harbor that they could go to. And even there, they weren't going to get much, right? Um, and so this started to kind of actually be a bit of a barrier to capitalist imperialism, right? Like we're not talking that long ago. I don't remember exactly when the Perry expedition was. I think it was like the 1850s, but really not that long ago. Like it was before the American Civil War. So I think it was then. Um, but basically what wound up happening was abruptly um, Commodore Perry of the American Navy showed up with a couple of very powerful state-of-the-art um, gunships, sailed into a Japanese harbor and was just like, open up, we'll be back in six months or a year, I forget what it was, uh, and we expect you to be open to the rest of the world by then and allow our people to um, resupply and to trade with us, otherwise things are going to be bad. Um, and Perry Anderson here kind of makes it out to be like a pretty, like it was a pretty chaotic uh, <laughs> transition. We'll get to kind of the political uh, implications of all of this, but he kind of makes it seem like it was a very short transition for Japan was closed and then Japan was open. I think it was a bit more of a complicated process than that. It wasn't like that, you know, Commodore Perry showed up and then everything was just open and fine and all of the samurai were just cool with that. It was a bit of a chaotic process that lasted a couple decades, but Suffice it to say, eventually, um, Japan wound up opening itself up to trade and to foreigners. And um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about this, but I was fascinated by like how this created a switch in political power from the shogunate back to the emperor and about how this kind of led to the one of the more famous things in Japanese history, which is the Meiji Restoration, which is to say the restoration of imperial power. This, this is... Yeah, again, this is something that I would have been like, wait a minute, is this not just a step back? What's going on? But it was a pretty massive, what he says, like a radical transformation of a country kind of without um, uh, comparison. Although maybe you could say like the Communist Party taking over China, but pretty fucking crazy nonetheless. Yes, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a radical turnaround and one that I don't necessarily fully understand. And I'll explain why what I don't necessarily understand about it in a minute. But um yeah, you're you're right that from the way that Perry Anderson depicts it, like the the rulers of the Tokugawa Shogun, it was immediately apparent to them that they were militarily totally outmatched by the West, um, and and I, I think therefore also actually quite clearly outmatched by their internal political rivals as well. Um, you were right before to bring up the the sort of devalued nature of the Japanese currency because when they suddenly realized, okay, we're going to have to engage in some kind of foreign trade, they what became apparent immediately was that all these foreign powers weren't going to recognize their currency as being at parity or pegged to any commodity in a way that other foreign currencies were. So then they had to massively devalue their currency vis-a-vis -vis foreign trade, which had this horrible and really catastrophic knock-on impact on the price of um, consumer goods inside Japan, and I think even on like rice prices and this kind of thing. So like further leading into this so degree of social disquiet. 
one of the central pressures I think that fell upon the shogunate was this criticism from the sort of was rather the lasting legacy of the xenophobic nature of Japanese society at this time, and there was real resistance from um, significant uh, portions of the nobility and people localized around the emperor to this degree of opening up, this degree of um, uh, intermingling with foreigners. Um, the thing that confused me was that the one of the central results of the the Magi restoration and the um, toppling of the shogunate and the um, the taking of power by the emperor and by people localized around him, that also actually just led to, well, it led very directly and very expeditiously to a whole load of pro-capitalist reforms that they brought about. But obviously it also in some ways inevitably led to this, um, to a degree of, openness with the outside world unless the the implication is that they managed to balance the two right between like um a building of um a japanese capitalism that didn't that still managed to maintain to some degree a um degree of xenophobia and skepticism toward contact with the outside world i don't know what your understanding of that um history think... as described here was he he i was confused by this and i had to do a bit more research on it and i'm still kind of confused because he seems to be basically saying that the restoration of the emperor as somebody that matters at all and it's like the central pole of japanese politics came about because of these so-called satcho samurai and satcho is basically like a mashing together of two different domains in the south of japan who were kind of, what were they called? Te, uh, Tozama Samurai, Tozama um, Daimyo, which is basically another way of saying like outsider Daimyo, outsider, people who were like kind of far away from the Shogunate's capital and who kind of didn't really play by the Shogunate's rules ever really and always kind of had their own interests. There was an alliance of mainly two of these domains that led to a brief civil war that restored the emperor. And he kind of paints them as reactionaries in this and as like wanting to return to like when Japan, you know, was xenophobic, I guess. But the more research you do, it actually seems to be like a lot of those samurai were, there's a word for this, but they were like young samurai and they were actually, they were incredibly xenophobic, but they were also like, what we need to actually do is get on the West's level. Right. And it wasn't, it wasn't like they were crazily militarily outmatched. They had cannons, they had forts, they had all of these things. It's just that they kind of preferred to use like swords, as we've said on the show, maybe 90 episodes before. I think swords are cool. I think that's, you know, that's all I'm saying. I think it's actually pretty cool. Um, but it's strange because it seems like simultaneously there's this reactionary class of samurai who are overthrowing the shogunate, restoring imperial power, but then who are also like actually kind of progressive in their like, okay, maybe we do just kind of like need to, they weren't explicitly saying we need to do capitalism, but they were like, we need to um, industrialize and we need to modernize our political structures. And kind of counterintuitively, that meant restoring the emperor because he was the one other pole of political power that could challenge the shogunate, even if it's a weakened state, right? So... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it does make sense in a, in a if you're suddenly um, engaged once again with the outside world, one which is um, capitalist and which is advancing in 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 ways just industrially advancing, I suppose. I we've you see this throughout history and throughout all sorts of different other countries' transition to capitalism, right? Maybe you even see it. Um, after the 1848 revolutions in Europe, in Germany, um, you see it in Bismarck, right? Like um, there's suddenly realization that you have to liberalize in some ways to then allow yourself to be economically and uh, militarily as well competitive. So there are a whole series of liberalizations, one of which is like um, making everybody equal before the law, which is like a, a sort of necessary juridical step toward capitalism but also the breaking down of all these internal barriers toward trade all the things that prevent people from you know, like merchants from owning land um so it is an economic liberalization that allows i think for 
a conservative politics to hold, I suppose, which is which is what you see in uh, many accelerated government led transitions to capitalism. Yeah, sure. One of the, one of the funny things when I was looking this up is that when you look at the two main people who led the kind of like Sat Cho alliance, it's really funny because like there are photos of them and some of the photos of them, it's like they're in their like old school badass samurai garb. And then it's like a couple decades later, there are photos of the same people and they're just in like Western suits. <laughs> it's just like, whoa, <laughs> it's like this was quick, wasn't it? That's mm-hmm. insane. Um, Dan, we've been recording for about an hour. I think this is the perfect time to get into the next paper. Do you have anywhere you have to be? Because it would be good to quickly go through this one. No, let's, this just, is, let, no, let's do it. You yeah, know what? Yeah. Let's do it. So basically... Um, yeah, yeah, go for it. I, I was just going to say, this is kind of where the appendix and lineages of the absolute estate ends. He's kind of just like, oh yeah, anyways, they opened up, they kind of liberalized, and his thesis, one of the last lines is, and thus... Japan transitioned from feudalism to capitalism basically without an interregnum at, interregnum at all. It just kind of happened. And we were originally going to read for this episode as well the next appendix, because there are two appendices in here, on the Asiatic mode of production. Um, after getting through this one, we were just kind of like, actually, there's so much in this that we I think would probably take up a lot of our time that maybe we don't do that. We save it for another time. But we also wanted to read a little bit something extra so we picked this other essay this is called the pressure of the east and it kind of picks off picks up where he left off here right and what it is is it's perry anderson responding to a paper we didn't read by somebody named chalmers johnson who i think wrote a paper or something that might have just been called the pressure of the east without the question mark where he was basically comparing pressure in germany um and its transition from you know ununified state agrarian led to um eventually from capitalist state to then fascist state right he's comparing that to um japan because on first glance there are a lot of very similar um things that happened in their relative you know transitions from feudalism to capitalism and I suppose this person was like, well, somebody should write something about comparing these two things for, you know, some sort of like analysis of the transition debate stuff. And Perry Anderson comes along and is like, this is a great paper. This is awesome. But we also need to focus on what's different. And in so doing that, he basically shows, um, you know, what wound up happening after this kind of opening up of Japan and kind of the restoration of the emperor. Japan still has an emperor, which I always find very funny. I always forget about that. Every now and then he just shows up in the news and it's like, oh, there he yeah, is. Yeah, I had to the Google it. Like, does, it does, the emperor, does Japan still have an emperor? Yeah, we're just allowed to carry on. Yeah. It's still allowed to carry on. Incredibly funny. Um, just to run through the similarities that Perry Anderson lists here between Prussia and um, Japan, eventually Germany and Japan, basically says that both of these states were late industrializers, right? That compared to like, I suppose the benchmarks, what Western Europe, um, he says that they were unified within a few years of each other, which is really interesting by a regional agrarian elite in Japan. We've been talking about, this was kind of the outsider, the Tozama samurai and the Tozama daimyo that we were just talking about. Whereas in Prussia, and this is something we haven't talked about on the show at all. It was the kind of younger class, right? Where these kind of like fairly reactionary, um, agrarian elite, um, who wound up basically being pivotal in the transition to capitalism. He then says that there are two other similarities. He says that um, eventually they created imperial states that were aimed at industry and expansion, as we've just mentioned with Japan, and then eventually that uh, after World War I, uh, neither country was very happy, and maybe for different reasons. Germany, it's fairly obvious, they just kind of lost. Japan, not so obvious. They actually kind of kicked Russia's ass, and then... Um, were kind of like screwed over at the, I think Theodore Roosevelt led peace talks that came about after World War I, where there was a lot of racism going on and they were just like, Japan, that's not a real country. And they kind of just like gave Russia everything that they wanted, even though they'd got their ass kicked. Um, so it was really interesting. I don't know how familiar you were with like this period of German history or Prussia in general. Um, I feel like a lot of my knowledge about Bismarck and these things come from its relationship specifically just to the critique of the Gotha program and to Ferdinand LaSalle. <laughs> but um, the transition debate stuff, you can, again, you can't really deny it. There are a number of similarities between the development of Germany and Japan, which are really interesting. Yeah, I thought I found the parallel, parallels really fascinating. I sort of 
have studied some of this history a little bit. Um, I remember being particularly struck by the the nature of the transition to capitalism in Germany and sort of like the degree to which it was orchestra- orchestrated, or I suppose, or like um, an attempt to overcome a relative backwardness in comparison to Britain and um, to some extent France, I suppose. Um, yeah, the, I mean, yeah, the parallels are fascinating. One of the things he said here is the... Um, the Maggi Restoration government like it deliberately models it, models itself on the Second Reich in some respects. So this is like the period between like eighteen forty eight and eighteen seventy one, or, or a little bit earlier actually. Um, but the sort of the Bismarck era, which would make perfect sense right there, attempting very rapidly to reform their economy um, toward capitalism. Um, and one of the other things that he talks about is that Japan had a very brief. Um, stint with democracy i suppose in the early period of the 20th century which was sort of like over overthrown at relatively the same time um as the weimar republic was um but yeah maybe we should get into some of the differences because i guess the purpose of this paper is to draw out how in actual fact they're not particularly similar or there are quite significant differences um as we've just been saying like japan was not only heavily feudal, but actually quite like industrially backwards compared to Germany that sort of had quite a sort of like flourishing bourgeoisie. I think the contrast he's making, we can see from the the appendix we read that although there, as we were saying before, there was sort of the development of these mercantile and industrial classes, like there weren't the same bourgeois tendencies toward reinvestment. Um, so they didn't really have the same um, class composition. Japan had a lot more work to do than Germany. Um, also, like their Germany has a much longer history of like civil strife, uh, revolution, um, philosophical and political tendencies, um, sort of like initially centered around sort of Hegelian liberalism, but a, a sort of like vibrant. Um, uh, political tradition, political parties that um, had um, basically basically like workers' parties that had to be repressed by Bismarck in order to make these transitions happen. And then therefore, when there was this sort of like after World War One, this re-emergence of democracy, there was a sort of like vibrant democracy in Germany that sort of didn't really exist um, in, in um, Maggiore, uh, Japan. Um, the thing that the the bit that interested me the most was the sort of like relative comparison between um, Nazi fascism in Germany and uh, Japanese fascism, and the relative like pressures that they were under, and what led them to then, or what to, what led their elites to take these um, uh, right wing radical. Uh, political trajectories obviously we know that nazism in germany comes about because of the um, pressures on the weimar government that are coming from revolutionary workers movements and it's had this recent history with the um, 1919 revolution and um, a vibrant trade union movement and revolutionary parties Um, in comparison to japan the sort of primary social pressure that's actually happening at the time of the in the immediate aftermath of the of World War One was um, the Japanese peasantry, which is still the majority class, was under great pressure as a result of the um, the Wall Street crash and the ensuing economic crisis that sort of gripped the world. And so, in a lot of ways, Japanese fascism was a result of pressures from. The peasantry and a requirement to placate the peasantry more than it was a requirement to repress any nascent like uh working class or revolutionary movement yeah well yeah i think there's a bunch of things to unpack from there i mean like um it japan's kind of rise to fascism i think always gets painted in kind of like western circles and kind of just like the global like understanding of world war ii as being completely akin to nazi germany right because they were on the same side and they were both fascists so it must have all come about by the same thing but i mean exactly what you're saying like because of their different developments 
there were very different pressures that led to fairly similar outcomes, right? Like in, in expansion, an expansionary imperialist power um, focused on expanding and invasion. But I mean, that's one of the things that I think Perry Anderson focuses on about the difference in their, you know, unique brands of fascism that's, I think, worth touching on is that he says that like Japan needed kind of like used fascism to expand first, right? Like Japan compared to Germany was much more reliant on um, international trade than Germany was. Japan obviously had like a massive, much more sweeping modernization than Germany, but it also occurred, as he says, in like a much more backward context. And this kind of like, even though we're talking about a period of, you know, I suppose, what are we talking about? Maybe like 70 years. So there's quite some time that goes in between the Meiji Restoration and, you know, like World War II or whatever, or the beginning of the Pacific theater of the war there. Um, it's worth basically seeing the through lines between all of this stuff. And one of them he basically says is that because after the major restoration, Japan was eventually so reliant on international trade, they felt the need that they needed to cut off that reliance and expand their territory much farther, right? And I mean, like, we were talking about this before the show, before we actually started recording, that like, we came across this in our reading about China because of their initial expansion into Manchuria, right? And I'm not necessarily certain why they didn't begin to develop industry in, within Japan itself, because most of their industry wound up being developed in Manchuria. And I mean, I posited before we started recording, maybe this was just because they were literally using like slave labor in a lot of circumstances in Manchuria to expand their manufacturing base. And they needed this kind of like primitive accumulation that was, you know, racked with violence and uh, massacres and all these terrible things that the kind of primitive accumulation of other imperialist capitalist societies, you know, Britain, America, all of these places, Spain, Portugal, this was a similar thing that they all went through. Japan was obviously going through much later. But comparing that to Germany and to Nazi Germany, Germany basically needed fascism to be a counter-revolutionary force to put down, as you were saying, these like massive workers parties that had grown up in the wake of, you know, the reform era and the um, aftermath of World War I, these like heavily revolutionary pressures and insurgent workers movement, and they needed expansion second, whereas it was kind of flipped in Japan, right? Like there was a communist party in Japan, but it was very small when it was able to basically just be crushed with force. And there was never really a social democratic party of note in Japan, whereas you know, again, that was not very true in Germany. I was kind of thinking about like how much this, I told myself I was going to go back to the Palmatic essay on Monopoly Capital to see how much I could like actually kind of like try and combine these two things. It didn't actually do that. But I was wondering like maybe the analysis I was missing here was an analysis of Monopoly Capital and the role that played in um, fascism. But to a certain extent, I actually kind of just found this a little bit more um, uh, compelling because it was just like, you know, here are these, I suppose, ideologies that were going around and material necessities of these kind of like developmental regimes, although I suppose it's not quite right to call either of these developmental regimes, but I don't know. It would be worth eventually me going back to that Pulmatic essay to see if anything can be kind of like combined from these, but yeah, it was interesting. Fascism is not something we've talked about a lot on the show just because of this period of history. I don't know. I'm just going to have really talked about it a whole lot, but um in these nine pages of this essay, I did really appreciate Anderson's very like quick and to the point. Here are the similarities, but here are the differences between these two fascist societies. The form matters, I guess, you know. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Muted myself so long ago anyway. Uh, maybe maybe it's something we should look at more. Um, the because just because it's easy to say fascism and imagine Nazi Germany, but like um as a political tradition it probably has a lot more uh, particularity in particular contexts and a, a lot more political dynamism even dare i say in the sense of that like there's a lot of differences um a lot of nuance so something that i definitely don't understand um and could do well to know more about um i guess the only maybe it's the only one maybe the, the only other distinction that he makes really between these two is the sort of like post world war ii um uh rebuilding of germany in comparison to japan whereas like german society is totally shattered by the sort of like absolute defeat of world war ii and also 
the there are numerous world powers that are sort of occupy different parts of it and have different demands upon um uh german society one of the interesting things that i hadn't really thought about before was that uh, one of the reasons why he suggests one of the reasons why there was a um, significant investment in rebuilding and developing a trade union movement in West Germany was under the influence of the Labour government in Britain, and that was one of the things they pushed for as part of the sort of like um, rebuild, rebuilding process of Germany. Um, in comparison, Japan like was occupied by America and was. Um, rehabilitated entirely under its sort of like guidance and tutelage i suppose um one of the interesting things was the extent to which the like leading figures in the liberal democratic party which came to be like basically japan's been like a one-party state it's a democracy but like one one party just basically wins all the elections and that's sort of been the case well it was definitely the case for the for the first like 60 years or something after world war ii i'm not entirely sure the ins and outs of japanese um politics now uh but a lot of the people that went into the liberal democratic party were just the sort of like significant figures from the imperial regime that existed before it kind of thing there was a degree of continuity between the two um uh which didn't really exist didn't really happen in after the fall of nazi germany yeah, that was fascinating. Just like because Germany itself was split up into all of these different regions, obviously East Germany had its Soviet influence and you had the kind of like British influence, you had the French influence, all of these different things. I mean, this was written several decades ago before Germany was unified again. And so Barry Anderson places a whole lot of stock in this being like, oh, and Germany, once it you know unifies again, it's going to be kind of crazy for Europe, isn't it? It's going to be a really powerful state. And there's talk of a European uh, confederation. Whoa, my. But um, this was, I mean, you know, we were joking about the fact that Japan still has an emperor. There's a reason for that. America was much more conservative in its... Um, occupation of japan than certain other powers were in different aspects of germany right like obviously the soviet occupation of east germany was much different than the kind of like british controlled parts or the nato controlled parts or whatever but um in japan it was you are going to do capitalism along our lines and you're going to crush the labor movements um and that's basically it. You're going to have one party that we know can, you know, be a liberal democracy and you're going to trade with us. And that's kind of it. Um, yeah, very funny. The picture, whenever you look up pictures of, uh, if you just Google Japan's emperor, he looks very polite. Looks like a very funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Interesting stuff. That's like, that's as a result of a thousand years of being politically, politically insignificant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there he is. Just he seems quite nice. Um, yeah, very interesting stuff. We should find some more reading about this kind of process of, um, the role that the Junker class played in, um, developing capitalism in Germany, I think, because mm. it's, it's really fascinating because he makes the point that like, you know, industry was well developed along the Rhine, right? Like there was a capitalist class in, in certain regions of Germany, but, due to certain, I suppose, just other factors, a kind of liberalization under their auspices was not necessarily possible. And the only class that was able to do it was, again, the kind of like landed aristocracy, which is not how you're supposed to do it. That's backwards, according to my Marxist <laughs> teleology. But the interesting thing, the reason he brings it up is because he is like, you know, the Junkers eventually became capitalists, whereas the samurai were just kind of like swept, swept away. You know, they were they didn't become capitalists. They had lived out in the kind of towns for long enough. They didn't really have much of a connection to their land. And so it's interesting. Yeah. And yet we all have capitalism now, Dan, which is the thing. It's like, <laughs> How did that oh, happen? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it happened because some Americans sailed into yeah, a harbor exactly. in Japan and was like <laughs> capitalism or your life. And they were like, yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah, okay. uh, all right. Well, that was our uh, Japan episode where definitive we tried statement to understand on Japan. Japan. Our definitive statement on Japan. <laughs> we will be reading nothing else about it other than this appendix and this nine-page essay. <laughs> I mean, it's funny, right? Because the first one of the first things we read for the show was the Ellen Mason's Wood, and she was criticizing this book. So for yeah, certain things, right? I mean, book. she was like, you know, it's good. Yeah, fuck, we're going to have to read this book. 
this is our promise to the listener. Within the next hundred episodes, we will read this book. <laughs> It'll take us many episodes, but we will do it. I was there were there were points when I was worried reading this appendix. I was like, how much of this am I going to not be able to understand because I haven't read <laughs> lineages of the absolute state? But um, yeah, it was relatively little or nothing. So yeah, exactly. It was good. All right. Well, um, I got a notification on my phone. I have notifications turned on from one baseball reporter who announces basically all of the moves. And I got a notification from it. And I panicked about halfway through this episode thinking that Shohei had signed. He had not, Dan. So I'm going to go back to just staring at my phone waiting for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, There you go. That was our Japan (laughs) episode. Oof. Hour 27. Good Lord. Mm. Um, Do we have anything to say about Henry Kissinger? He's dead. He's dead. (laughs) The good die young. That's all I, I got to say. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we don't have anything to say. Good. Right. Yeah. I mean, we should have just should have just passed over it in silence. Maybe you cut. Maybe just cut it. <laughs> we'll have a moment of silence. This is where the episode okay. ends. We only the only reason we would have talked about Henry Kissinger is if we had talked about him in our last episode, much like when we killed Donald Rumsfeld. Uh-huh. So yeah. or was it Kissinger or not Kissinger? No, Who was no, it that Rumsfeld. we killed? We killed Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld. It was Rumsfeld. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think we should say that personally. <laughs> yeah, not McNamara. It was, in fact, yeah. Rumsfeld. This is why right. we're never going to read any Noam Chomsky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why. <laughs> All right. I'm well, sure there are other reasons. There are other reasons, indeed. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, we will be back in two weeks, and yep. I enjoyed this. It was it was good fun. It was good fun. Thank you. Thanks everybody for making it this far. An hour and twenty eight, almost. 29 minutes. (laughs) Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Jack. Goodbye. See you. Hey, everybody. Jack here. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. The song that you heard on this episode is Music to Kill Bad People To by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. You can go ahead and check this song out much, 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 much more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com. If you want to go ahead and get in touch with us, chat shit, tell us that we're wrong, whatever you want to do, you can go ahead and do that at auxiliarystatements at gmail.com. You can just send us a message there. Or you can get in touch with us on Twitter, on Discord, on Instagram. You're a smart person. You can find these places. we got a YouTube. We post stuff there as well. Sometimes we stream. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time. Whoa.